Matt Gathu talks about success our community can have with less abrasion and grief. What a welcome relief. So that's something we really should stress. Hey, hello everyone. Hi. Hi. Oh, um, I'm super excited to be here. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Matt, uh, all the way from uh, <coughs> Ras, Nairobi. Just a minute. Uh, okay. So yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, so my talk is about uh, Rust community, supercharging Rust community. And uh, my story of how I got into Rust was that uh, in 2017, uh, I got lucky to be accepted in the first uh, Rust, Rust Rich program. And I spent uh, three months working with really nice mentors. Uh, I believe one of the mentors is here. Uh, and uh, also working with uh, another colleague. And we were basically in different places. We, we had different interests, different nationalities. And I got a really good experience uh, from, from those three months. And uh, the fact that the RAS community was welcoming um, and good to me, felt, uh, it became, it, I felt challenged. And I, I decided that I will start uh, a meetup uh, locally. So, and here we are. That's why I started the uh, Ras Nairobi uh, meetup group. We've been there since uh, November of, uh, actually October of last year, and um, it's been great so far. And <clears throat> so I was thinking when I got the invitation to come speak, um, I thought it would be great to talk about community since it's how I got into Rust, and it's something I, I really care about. So. Uh, this is a map of countries around the globe where there is a sort of rust interest. So there are actually rustations in these countries. And this is based on uh, the Twitter followers of the official uh, rust account. And I want to show you uh, another map. So this is another map. And it shows countries where we have uh, Rust meetup groups, or there's like a Rust user group. Um, and this is based on uh, off from uh, uh, meetup.com. And if you kind of just uh, compare the two maps, you can see that uh, there are way more countries where there's actually interest in Rust, and there are uh, Rust developers, but there are no like uh, communities, or they are not visible. And um, my talk is designed uh, around that. How do we scale communities uh, to be worldwide, you know, scale it beyond uh, what we currently have? And uh, personally, from experience, when I started uh, Rust Nairobi, it's not easy. And even uh, I've, I've been having a few conversations with uh, people who are involved in running meetup, uh, meetup groups and communities, and they say uh, it's not easy. And I personally felt challenged. Uh, it felt almost like I need to build this thing, and I'm alone. I don't know how to start. Uh, but having had the experience from the Rust Rich program, I knew that Rust itself, as a project, it's a really, uh, it's a success. It's a triumph. And, uh, and this can actually be shown. There's uh, data that actually shows uh, how uh, Rust as a project is successful. So, uh, and just to highlight this, so there was the, I believe it's the 2018 uh, Stack Overflow Developer Survey. Uh, in this survey, um, we had 78% uh, percent of the of the developers saying that they love uh, Rust. It's actually voted uh, the most loved language. And it's not only this year, it's been for the last uh, three years. 
uh, which is amazing uh, to see how much people love uh, Rust. Uh, there is uh, then the it's also a, a popular project on GitHub, and just looking at uh, the number of people who have actually done uh, contributions to the compiler, and that I this number could have changed because uh, there are always more contributors to the project, and also looking at the number of tools that people have built uh, with the language are based on the number of crates that are, are there on crates.io. And uh, the interesting thing is that this, uh, the number of crates have been growing uh, exponentially over time. So I started to ask myself that since Rust as a project is really successful, uh, what, what makes it so successful? What are the ideas uh, that the Rust project has? What is this thing that is being done so consistently that over the years there's been success stories, success stories? And how uh, can we learn uh, from this to build uh, our local communities? So uh, I have uh, several ideas that uh, personally, I think uh, are very important in the uh, uh, Rust project and that we can learn from. And uh, I'll talk about flat governance. Uh, I'll explain that. I'll also talk about diversity and inclusivity. Uh, also about uh, having a roadmap, having a vision. Also uh, decision making. Uh, and lastly, about having a code of conduct. And, uh, and the idea here is that since these ideas are sort of the spirit of the Rust project, then as Rust communities and we are, when we are building uh, local communities, we should also try and emulate uh, these ideas, or at least uh, they can be a guiding light to, uh, to our local communities. So on flat governance, so it's, it's very interesting and it's something I have noted uh, that in Rust, there is no hierarchy in how the project is done. There are actually uh, sub-teams that are divided and they are more or less independent of each other and uh, are very uh, autonomous. And the interesting thing about that is that things get to move uh, really fast, because you don't have that bureaucracy of someone uh, or the head of something has to approve uh, anything. And also there is trust between each of the team because you believe that um, the other team knows what they, what they are doing and you trust in them. And I think this is very important even in our communities. So like when I was searching uh, Rust Nairobi, I tried to as quickly as possible get uh, other organizers involved. I didn't want to be the only person uh, heading the meetup. So at the moment, we, uh, we have uh, four uh, people in the organizing team. And the idea is that for we to like, uh, have a meetup or have a talk or do something administrative, like getting even as simple as getting someone into our Slack organization or our WhatsApp group, doesn't need for like one person to do that. If you're part of the organization team, at least you should be able uh, to do that. And I think uh, this model of governance where there is no uh, one head of that is really great. So uh, going back to uh, my story about how uh, I joined the Rust community, so diversity and inclusivity is more or less that, because uh, the Rust Bridge program is designed to get Rust uh, into uh, two underrepresented groups. And um, I felt uh, that having a goal, such a goal was really great, because the, the community gets uh, diversified. And I think also if we are doing local communities, we should also uh, be conscious about uh, and be very deliberate in um, making diversity uh, a thing. And um, 
I know diversity uh, and from experience is, is not easy. Uh, so I have this picture. This picture was from the first workshop we did. Uh, it was in April. And, uh, and I'm sure most of you are thinking it's a weird picture there. And I'm talking about diversity because if you look at it, uh, there is no lady on the, in the picture. Yeah? And, um, and I realized that it's, it's, it's hard, but I think we have to be deliberate conscious. And it's something that uh, me and my organizers are constantly thinking of. How do we make it easier for uh, more people you know, of all genders, of all uh, uh, technical skills to come and join our groups? So this, this particular one here, we were, the majority of people who attended were college students. And we had targeted that. We, we knew there were people who are professional developers who are doing Rust in Nairobi, but we also knew that there's a, a community of students who are not even aware of the language. So also thinking of how uh, you can reach out to people uh, and basically improve the diversity and inclusivity. Then um, on the roadmap. So, um, so earlier on this year, there was the the call for blog posts. This was before the RAS 2018 roadmap. So the roadmap is, was mostly uh, influenced by the survey that was done in 2017, and also the call for blog posts, which was uh, people talking about what they would want to see uh, in RAS this year. And based off that, we have the, the roadmap where now we have uh, you know, working groups coming uh, out of that. And uh, the fact that you have uh, sort of a plan for what you're doing. Uh, you're not, uh, like for us, it's not like we, we do a meetup every month. We kept asking ourselves, what do we want to see in our community in Nairobi? Where do we want it to go? And uh, early on this year, we said uh, we have a goal that in 2018, we'd like to do uh, a rust day event, so before the year ends. And how do we get there? So we said, we will have uh, meetups and we will also do workshops. We will also try to do outreach, uh, go to schools, uh, speak to students, and all that being geared to uh, the actual event at the end of the year. And this was, by and large, heavily influenced with how actually the RAS project is run, because also the project has a, a vision and a roadmap that we use as a guiding light to, to doing that. And the good thing about having a roadmap is that when you accomplish one thing, accomplish a task, it's uh, a time for you to uh, celebrate because you've met uh, a milestone in your journey. Also, it shows uh, that the community has a shared vision. When you have new members, they, they feel connected and they know that there's a journey uh, and there's a story to this uh, community. So I also think that this is a very good a thing to have when you're starting a, a local Rust community. Then, um, a minute. So there's this thing called uh, the RFC process, which is basically how uh, features and uh, changes to the last, uh, the Rust language are made where someone suggests a feature, you have people deliberate about it, discuss, and then decide uh, whether we are accepting it or rejecting it and why. And uh, this process is also very open. So you could go on GitHub and see all the RFCs that have been done. You could go to uh, the users' uh, forums and see the discussions what, what that were had. And uh, the fact that this process is open and that the decision that is made, for example, when you decide to accept or, or reject an R, uh, RFC, it is not made behind closed doors. It's not made by one person. It is made by the community uh, through active discussion and deliberation. I think it's something uh, really cool about Rust. And I like it because I can always 
go and see why stuff was done and why uh, things are the way they are. And I also think this is important in our communities, more so if you're doing something that uh, is important to everyone, you should not make that decision yourself. You should try and seek feedback, and this can be through having town halls or actually sending a simple feedback form uh, to your members and then using that to guide your decision uh, when, you're, when you're deciding or doing an important uh, decision. Then um, on the code of conduct. So I really like uh, this quote. Uh, it's by, by Graydon. So I think that uh, one of, and this I feel like sometimes is underrated, uh, why the, the RAS community is very welcoming. Uh, it's a very safe community, and there's a lot of respect for you uh, as an individual. And uh, I think it's because even early on when the community was coming up, there was a very uh, big uh, conscious effort to make sure that the community will be safe, that it will be open and welcoming. Uh, and I've seen, um, I remember reading a discussion online where someone asked why uh, the RAS code of conduct is a little weird to them. And uh, this quote is pulled from that, where Gredon is explaining that uh, he wanted uh, the RAS community to, to be a home because uh, developers would go to other forums, other communities, and it was uh, a bit uh, toxic to them. And I think we should also spread this message for our local communities that we are very conscious of uh, people who join us. We are open and welcoming, and we also uh, care about uh, your safety and also show, uh, show respect. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, uh, I think that we should also take time to reflect and think about what we do uh, as a community. Uh, and the reason for this is that it allows you to take a moment uh, and breathe and also look at uh, you know, what is working right, uh, what is uh, going wrong, where, where can we uh, improve, you know, and, um, and even also getting uh, feedback from, from the community. And it allows you to iterate faster. So for example, when we did our first uh, workshop, we, you know, we talked to the participants and asked them, what, what did you like about the workshop? Uh, what didn't you like? What do you think should be improved? And um, that sort of uh, introspection and reflection uh, really goes uh, a long way since when we are planning our next workshop, we are able to improve on uh, things that we didn't do quite well and also keep up the good stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I think um, community is uh, way more than you just being part of a group. I think it matters what you do because what you do is what uh, makes uh, that belonging important to you. It's not just a matter of saying you're in the group, but even the people you interact with and what you work on uh, is also of importance. And making uh, that environment uh, is really great. And lastly, I would like to leave you with a quote. Uh, not to, <laughs> don't ask what the community can do for you, but instead ask what you can do for the community. Thank you. We do have a lot of time.
Um, so we can take questions. Are there questions? There's a question. If you had um, one advice to give to someone who um, wants to open a, um, say, meetup in, in an area where there is no, um, say, Rust meetup or anything else, yeah. um, what would that advice be? Um, it would be to, to be, pa to be uh, persistent, uh, don't give up. So I remember uh, the, the first two meetups that we had uh, for Rust Nairobi. Um, so, uh, you know, in my mind, I knew that this is the first uh, Rust meetup in Nairobi. This is going to be a lot of people will show up, and we had like a budget for like uh, 20, 30 people, and then I think only four or five people showed. And uh, I remember there was at the end of the meetup, there was so much food and juice left. So we were actually telling people, "Can you carry this home?" Because uh, we bought all this stuff, but nobody showed up. And it happened for uh, like the first two, uh, two meetups, and then later on we got the numbers. So I think uh, being persistent is, is, is key, yeah. Do we have more questions? Hi, thank Hi. you. Oh, that's very close. Thank you so much for, for the wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to know what your tips would be to keep a meetup interesting enough for more experienced um, users, and but still accessible enough for someone who's coming for the first time. Yeah, so <coughs> yeah, that's a very good question because it's something that we are actually uh, struggling with. And uh, what we thought was, because we knew that we couldn't always be doing uh, like beginner talks, right? But we thought, how do we uh, sort of cater for the two groups where you have people who are new to Rust and you have people who are already used to it. So one idea we thought of is we would do workshops and these workshops are meant for uh, beginner people. Essentially, uh, uh, rope, him, rope, rope them, in, them in and then during our normal meetups, those are a bit more uh, sort of not beginner talks so that we can also cater for uh, the, the guys who are already uh, attending our meetups. And even, because uh, I mentioned we, we plan to have uh, an event at the end of the year, that was an idea of once we do this workshop, then we will have more in-depth uh, workshop catering now for like intermediate uh, devs. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm from Madagascar, and uh, the reason why we couldn't make a meetup at one time, the, the discussion came up, was because most people were not comfortable or didn't know how to uh, start contributing. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for somewhere to learn how do you even start, make a contribution to, uh, to code and, and things like that. So I was wondering if you, in Kenya, you, you found uh, something to palliate that kind of fear, I guess, of uh, exposing yourself in public? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, what we've, we've uh, sort of done is, uh, earlier on we looked at uh, companies that were, tech companies that were active in Nairobi, and uh, one of the uh, projects we did was uh, get our library was that was it was written in Python for an, an API uh, wrapper and rewrite it in Rust. And since, since the majority of uh, the techies are actually familiar with that API, since the companies are, are very popular there, then it is very easy to rope them in because they will have taught, somewhat have done uh, the same thing in a different language. Uh, also, uh, I try to go and speak to uh, communities like not Rust community, so I've spoken to the Python community at home, uh, telling them about Rust and what it is about, and trying to get them involved too. So, 
also think even getting, sourcing existing uh, tech communities can be good. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, hello, I, I'd like to, to add another remark regarding the introspection uh, point you made. Um, I think it's, um, it's more general than the community, the history of the community. It's um, the history of the computer science in general, I think. And because uh, r the Rust community learns a lot from what other languages have done in the past and one, what mistakes they have done. And I think that it's, uh, it's the great uh, um, uh, force of uh, the Rust uh, community. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. I think, because uh, I, I kept asking myself, I don't have to sort of figure out uh, how to build a great community because the Rust project is really good and the Rust community is really good. So what can I learn from that? And yeah, I agree the fact that Rust has learned from uh, other communities too. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks our speaker again.